Namaskaram, Vanakam, and welcome, friends. I just want to start today by thanking you so much. I'm absolutely uh, touched and moved by the, the number of subscribers and how much you guys have helped to grow my channel over the last month. It's just awesome that we can have this community together. And thank you so much for everyone who comments on my videos. I do my best to respond. Uh, sometimes I get a little overwhelmed, uh, but I do read them. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so, so very much. Now today we have a, a bit of a, a special video. So I've been asked a few times in different videos, how did I find Sanatana Dharma? How did I end up accepting it? And this is a story that I haven't shared in a public forum before because it's very private and very close to my heart. Uh, only like my closest friends know this story. But I thought, you know, it's something that I've kept to myself for 13 years and it's probably time now to share it. So here we go. Now, a little bit about my background before Sanatana Dharma. Uh, I grew up in a secular household, however, I did go to Catholic school as a child, and I can remember back then uh, having a lot of problems with the theology that they taught. I can remember being about 10 years old and taking issue with the idea of one true religion, and that's it, and the issue of eternal damnation, and I actually I asked a teacher about it and got in trouble. Uh, because I didn't have enough faith. So I was never really that close with the theology, never really took it on board. I mainly went because I had an excellent education compared to the other schools in my region. Uh, and I'm very fortunate for that education that led me up through working on a PhD. So I have gratitude for that, but I didn't really take to uh, the spiritual side of things. Now we should take a time out uh, because I forgot to say this up front. If this video goes long, which it could, but I'm gonna try and like condense it, then I'll just split it into two parts and post them both around the same time so you can watch one after the other. Uh, but just be aware there's like a half hour limit on the, on the camera, so I might have to split it up. Anyway, so let's continue on. Uh, when I was about 13, 14 years old, I got really interested in meditation. And I read anything and everything I could on the internet about it, books from the library and bookshops. And I started to practice. Started to practice uh, mindfulness, especially breath techniques. And I was really into it. And it was right at that age where it's like you're not a child anymore, you're kind of stepping out into the world. And it's like I learned this new thing about exploring my own inner world. And I wanted more of it. Uh, a few years later, through my reading, I came across Buddhism. And I took to it right away. From about the age of 17 or so until my mid-20s, I was a practicing Buddhist. And I was pretty devout and I had really thrown myself into the, the practices of the tradition that, that I had belonged to. Uh, I didn't do any formal uh, taking refuge or taking precepts or anything like that. It was more of a home practice uh, throughout my first four university years. and. I really worked at the prescribed meditations and really wanted the things out of it that all of the uh, teachers said would come out of it. Uh, when I was at university, I started to also attend two different Buddhist temples, a Thai temple and a Vietnamese temple that were lovely, but I always kind of felt like an outsider. It was not really, I never felt like I was in the community those temples seemed more to be spaces for community fellowship versus serious spiritual endeavors. And I don't say that to detract from them. However, they served more of a cultural function in my experience than they did in terms of teaching, uh, the Buddhist teachings. But I stuck with it. And in 2003, so this was like my third year at university, second year at university, I can't remember, I took my first trip to India. And I spent a, a lot of time there. I was there for a, a bit over a month and it was a study abroad. So I was with a group of other American students and we went all over. We were in Delhi and we went to Patna and Bodh Gaya and we went to Varanasi. Then we went up to Dharamsala. We, spent, we went to Punjab. Then we went up to Ladakh and spent a week in Ladakh. And I'm going to share some stories 
with you guys about my first time in India when I go to India in January uh, because I want to take you to some of the places that where I was the first time and how meaningful and special they were. But I'll say this about that experience was every time we went into a Hindu temple there was a sense of familiarness and warmth and energy it really had that shakti really had that energy flowing in the atmosphere there was power there we went to some beautiful buddhist temples especially in bogaya and then up in ladakh or so these like massive statues of the bodhisattvas and uh, beautiful expressions of buddhism in, in more of a, a tibetan or vajrayana tantric form but in all of those buddhist temples i didn't get the same feeling it was kind of empty and it left kind of like a, a mark on me and it made me stop and think for a moment but I didn't make any life changes I continued on and I was working on my masters I was working on my masters in religion and my focus was on the intersection between religion and public health I was interested in uh, how religions shape people's attitudes especially around infectious disease and a part of my field work I was working in India and I was also at this time co-leading a study abroad of undergrads to Varanasi. And I wasn't supposed to stay in Varanasi. I was actually supposed to go to uh, some rural Buddhist communities and stay there to conduct my field work. And something had happened. I, I don't even remember the ins and outs of it at this, at this point, but uh, the US State Department put out a warning to all Americans not to go to the specific area that I was supposed to go to. There were some issues with Marxist separatists connect, uh, kidnapping foreigners and that type of thing. And all of a sudden, as a woman traveling alone, I didn't feel too comfortable <laughs> about continuing that. So I was left, you know, a week into my stay in Varnasi, completely lost as to what to do because I wasn't going to be able to conduct my field work. I wasn't going to be able to conduct the project that I had gotten funding to do. Uh, and that meant that I was also not going to finish my master's thesis on time. Fortunately, my major professor was the other person leading this study abroad and he said to me, you know, change your project. Stay here for the next month with us and start working on a project, start doing research around the Ganges around the Ganga and the public health situation there, you know, seasonal changes in flu, uh, outbreaks of typhoid, continuous malaria, that sort of thing. And I thought, why not? What a great idea. What a, what a great way to turn this around. So I had st stayed there uh, in Varanasi, one, one of my favorite places, Asigat, and I spent a lot of time just meeting people, sitting by the river, taking in life. And at some point I thought, you know what, if this river is the center of my work, and if the spirituality and the sacredness of the river are going to play an important role in my research, then I really ought to experience it as people who adore the river as devout Hindus do. I need to understand this from the inside out. And I knew, because I knew the background of some of like the industrial pollution that had happened further up the river from like the Nike factory and places like that, and issues with uh, sewage pipes that weren't repaired for a while. I knew like the logical Western mind was like, you sure you want to do this? But something changed. I said, you know what, I'm going to go do the bath. I will bathe in the river. I need to understand this feeling of why it's so important to the people. So I did. And as I stepped into the river, it was this uh, moment of just kind of letting go. Like all this stuff, the science mind knew didn't matter. It was about participating in something sacred. touching something so important, the object of devotion and prayers for millennia. A little old me stepping into it, having that type of darshan, and it was really powerful. 
and it left me really confused about, you know, what is my spiritual path? That was uh, 2007. Now, something really strange started to happen after that trip. I was there for over a month in 2007 at the beginning of the summer, and then the second half of the summer I was meeting a friend and we were going to travel through Europe and North Africa. Uh, specifically, we were in France, and then Greece, and then Tunisia. And weirdly enough, in both Tunisia and in Greece, in like the traditional marketplaces, I kept encountering carvings of Ganesha, which in an Orthodox Christian country and an Islamic country is kind of unusual. But he kept appearing. I thought, hmm, okay, maybe I misjudged these markets. Uh, it did strike me as odd. And then I was getting on a flight to fly. We had a, a layover in Scotland and then from Scotland back to the US. I was getting on the boarding the flight to Scotland and as I'm going through security, one of the security people pulled me over and said, excuse me, ma'am, is this yours? And they pulled out a silver statue of Ganesh about this, about this big. And I thought, ooh, how interesting that he keeps appearing. It wasn't my statue, so I, I said, no, I'm sorry. I thought maybe it belonged to the person in front of me. I don't know if they ever found uh, his home, but it really, it kind of gave me chills. Like, what is going on here? So fast forward a year. It's now summer of 2008, and I had kind of really fallen away from the Buddhist practice. I got disillusioned. I wasn't happy with the experience in temple life, and I also, so I didn't have a community, and I also didn't feel like I was making the progress that I felt I should be after having done this Buddhist practice for years and years and years. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I was really confused, so I just, you know, made this prayer to the universe. I said, look, I don't know if there's a god or there isn't a god. I don't know what's true and what's not, but show me. Whatever you show me, I'll follow that. And I prayed it for three weeks straight every night. The end of the third week, I had this really profound dream that absolutely changed everything. In the stream, the stream started and I found myself in a, a Christian church. And I didn't feel anything there. There were lots of people praying and doing their thing, and I didn't, I didn't feel God there. Then I found myself in a Buddhist temple. Same thing. It was peaceful. It was nice. People were meditating and practicing. I didn't feel a spark of the divine there. Then the scene shifted, and I was on this uh, green island, and there was like no trees or anything. It was just this green spot in the middle of the ocean. And there was a sadhu there, dressed in orange. And he approached me and he touched my forehead. And when he did, I had this vision. <laughs> I know some people might think this is like crazy, but uh, it was one of the most important, most profound moments of my life uh, because I saw Sri Bhagavan. I saw Lord Vishnu. And it wasn't just a seeing, it was something different. It was like being surrounded by this like infinite ocean of love. And this absolute moment of surrender. Whatever Bhagavan wanted, I'll do. And it was this feeling of being loved and also madly in love. And the scene shifted and he showed me a memory that I didn't know at the time was a memory, but now I do, which I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, he showed me this instant in the moment before I was born in this life. And in that time, I said to him, I don't want to be born in this life again. Don't, don't separate me. I don't want to be apart. And he's like, don't worry, we're never apart. And I said, okay, well, if this is, if this is what you want, then I'll do it. As if I had a choice. Uh, and then I was born. And I didn't know 
this part until several years later when my mother had told me that uh, I nearly died in birth. Uh, I was an emergency C-section, I was in distress, and I nearly died. So I thought, oh, there's something to that. When I woke up from this dream, I was in tears. I was in tears because I had something so sweet, so powerful, so uplifting. And then waking back up into this world, it felt like it was separate, it was gone. And I wanted it back so desperately. So the rest of that day uh, is interesting because as much as it felt separate, everywhere I looked, I can remember like going and standing by the ocean, I could feel Sri Bhagavan everywhere all around me. I had this sense, I can remember having um, some pierogies. Pierogies are, paper, uh, are potato dumplings, if for my Indian friends who don't know. Uh, they're very nice. And I could have, I had this sense when I, when I first ate them, like this is all at the mercy of Sriman Narayan. This is his food, this is his creation. It was one of the most powerful and most disruptive moments of my life. And it was the most disruptive because in that instant, overnight, my entire world changed. Everything changed. How I understood reality, I'd gone from being an agnostic because Buddhism doesn't really teach, at least in the, the sect that I was participating in, didn't really teach about God. They didn't say there wasn't a God, it just wasn't an important concept. So I went from being ag agnostic to being absolutely in love with Sri Vishnu. So it was this big life transition. And then I had to learn what does that mean? What does that mean for my life? How do I participate in this incarnation, in this life, in that eternal relationship? What are the rituals? What's the language? What are the do's and don'ts? How do I nurture that relationship in the here and now? How do I nurture that sense of, um, in Sri Vaishnavism, we call it prapati, uh, surrender. But not just surrender in action, but surrender in every sense of the word. How do I build and have that relationship? When I woke up that day, I knew there was no turning back. This was reality. This was it. I've never, in all the rest of my life, ever have encountered the feeling that I had in that dream and upon waking up. Never. I haven't had it since. So it's not something that like the mind just created because I had no frame of reference for it. So then from there on, then I had to kind of find, okay, well, where do I fit? I knew that uh, I am obviously a Vishnu devotee, but what does that mean? What's Sampradaya? What's, what's the philosophy? So I spent a lot of time searching. I spent, the, the first group that I connected with, uh, as I talked about in another video, were the Hare Krishnas, were ISKCON, because they're kind of the main introduction to Vaishnavism in the West. And I have such fond memories of the Kirtans and the Prasadam. I'll still go to, we have a temple here in Manhattan, I'll still go for, for Kirtan sometimes. And it was kind of the only place that I kind of felt like I had a spiritual root. However, it never quite felt right uh, just because of my preferred form of the divine. I love Krishna, I had a picture of him, and I'm very close with him, but really Sriman Narayan and Venkateshwara are kind of my, my main, the main forms that I really connect with. So it was just like little things like that. But I took in like everything that I could and much of what I know about being a Vaishnava, even though I'm not in that Sampradaya, is thanks to them, thanks to Srila Prabhupada and Iskhan. So then I had to do research on my own. I had to find what, what is that path, how do I become a, a, a Vishnu Bhakti, how do I become a follower, did lots of reading and I finally settled on Sri Vaishnavism and I've been chanting Om Namo Narayanaya ever since uh, thanks to the grace and mercy of Sri Ramanuja. And here I am, this is my story so far. And there are other things that go into this, like I said, that I, I'm going to share when we actually go to India because I want to show you some of the places. 
but this is how I became Hindu. So thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe. If you have other questions that you'd like me to answer that I'm able to answer, you know, put them in the comments below and I might do a Q&A video at some point. Other than that, thank you so much and I'll see you in the next video. Hurry on.